connection between disease and longevity. So we went to break talking about these mutations, uh, but also there's, there's been a lot said lately about, uh, about kids and, and the way that they're being raised and the threats that we perceive all around them. And some say that we've actually, in some cases, perhaps gone overboard to protect them too much from dirt, from right. germs, from you know, dirty dogs and, and, you know, and out, ca outdoor cats that come inside. What's your thinking about, about exposing children? What is evolution? What are the lessons herein tell us about how we raise our kids? Well, it's, first of all, it's important to consider that over millions of years, our immune system evolved to deal with multiple threats. And these are, you know, every microbe imaginable under the sun. And if you think about it, for also for a very long time, saber-toothed tigers haven't been, you know, eating us. It's, it's things we can't see that have been very, very deadly. So a robust immune response, which means an immune system that can kind of marshal the forces and, and fight effectively, is essential for survival. Now, we may be robbing our children of the very education that the immune system needs and what do I mean by education um, our immune system in especially when a child is born is somewhat it's called naive yes. so um, a child gets uh, antibodies from from its mother and and then the child begins to develop and sense what's in the environment and by sensing what's in the environment the child's immune system starts to learn the difference between friend and foe and by being able to discern what is the enemy uh, the immune system kind of begins to grow up as they say now if, if we are using antibacterial soap if, if we are not letting our children, uh, you know, contact with any other animals or maybe even a, any other kids, we're robbing them from that education process. Their immune system doesn't have that ability to discern. And the thinking is that without that proper education system, the immune system may turn around and declare war on self. And then what that means is that you end up with an autoimmune disease, that the immune system can't discern between what is, what is outside of the body and what should be removed, and ends up attacking its own organs and tissues. Some of these autoimmune diseases that we witness now in society, are they perhaps the product of some of the superior hygiene, the immunization courses, the you know, preventions of disease that we've managed to achieve in our lifetimes? That's a, that's a great question. So when you go to parts of the world that are, that are developing now and, um, you know, getting cleaner water and better food supply, the first rise in disease that you, you kind of seem to detect is autoimmune diseases, especially in children. So you see increases in, such as in asthma or Crohn's disease. And um, this is part of the thinking. As you clean up the water, as, as you're removing these organisms that our bodies kind of have to develop to, and to meet and to figure out what is enemy and what is, what is friend, you're taking away that education process. So some of the things that may trigger asthma may not necessarily have been the cause of asthma to begin with. It's the body reacting however the body chooses to because of perhaps a lack of other sorts of threats. And the other, the other things that we come to associate with asthma, you know, the diesel fumes in the air, mm -hmm. things like that, uh, are simply trigger mechanisms? Yes, and what happens is because of that, the, the theory is anyways that the lack of that education process, the mm -hmm. body starts recognizing, say, pollen, which is a common trigger for a lot of people with asthma, um, which is innocuous, you know, mm -hmm. this comes from, from, from flowers. Uh, and the reason is that the body, again, is seeing that as foreign and mounting a very strong response to it, mm -hmm. uh, which isn't needed and which ends up damaging tissues. It's like a suburban police force which doesn't have enough crime so they just take it out on every teenager with a car. Unfortunately. I got gotcha. you. Um, <laughs> bad metaphor, but no, actually not too bad, I don't think. Uh, talk to me then about immunizations. Mm -hmm. We now, we vaccinate left and right. And when I was a kid, you know, back this many years ago, uh, if Johnny down the block got chicken pox, all the moms seemed to get us all together, throw us in a room with Johnny so we'd all get over with chicken pox or, or mumps or German measles or whatever it was like that. There was, I think, one year in particular, we, we all got everything that one year. Now we, we, uh, we immunize, we vaccinate against many right. of these things. Does that help the immune system or does it open us up also? To, to potential threats. Well, it's a great question. I mean, and what you just described, you know, parents exposing essentially intentionally their kids so they can get it over with, uh, in a way is a form of immunization because then the body gets the disease. But thankfully today we have, you know, ways of getting an immunization where you don't have to get the full disease. Mm -hmm. And uh, the question really remains open and um, up for debate what, the, what are the long-term kind of consequences. But at least for now, it's definitely with most immunizations, you would say it's, it's worth any long-term complications because you're protecting your children. Talk to me about the uh, 
the connection with the, the H. pylori we talked about and, and the ulcers and some of the other things that we've learned from that. Well, H. pylori is fascinating. And, you know, this is a bug that was kind of newly rediscovered only in it. And, you know, the, one of the co-discoverers, Barry Marshall, won the Nobel Prize for this. Um, and essentially wasn't taken seriously because he said that ulcers are contagious. And ulcers are caused by this bug called Helicobacter pylori. Right, not by the stress we always thought about or by spicy food. Exactly, or exactly. And, you know, we believe that the stomach was essentially sterile. It's so acidic, nothing can possibly survive. Well, it turns out that, you know, nature has some tricks up her sleeve, and, the, and this amazing bacteria can survive in such an acidic environment by producing ammonia. It actually neutralizes the acid. And it seems that um, part of the response in which that your body tries to mount to fight and get rid of this infection, you end up with an ulcer and possibly stomach cancer as a result. Uh, malaria. We apparently now know or you, you've hypothesized that the body's battle against malaria in some cultures among some people has also had some implications here as well. Tell me about that. Sure. So this actually dates a long time ago. This is one of the first diseases, and this was, wasn't my work. This was almost 50 years ago, um, if not even more. And this was the first condition was called sickle cell anemia, where people, people kind of sat back and said, why is it so common in Africa? And it turns out that it offers some type of protection against malaria. But um, this was always seen as the exception. What I try to kind of put forward in, in, in my book is that the common diseases that we have that have this genetic and heritable, heritable component to it, um, these common diseases are, are actually, almost all of them, are these comp complicated compromises. So just as in malaria protecting, or sorry, sickle cell anemia being somewhat protective against malaria, but shortening your lifespan, these other conditions, in, um, you know, such as hemochromatosis, um, protecting you against uh, you know, infectious diseases as uh, is the bubonic plague. So mm -hmm. long term, these are the compromises that kind of came out and evolved. And the Alzheimer's angle we were talking about? Well, the Alzheimer's angle is really interesting. So this, this gene, which is one of the only genes that's really considered a robust risk factor for, it's called sporadic Alzheimer's disease, APOEE4, 30% of the population has it, but even if you have one copy, it doesn't mean you're going to get the disease. Uh, you know, 90% of people who have one copy don't go on to get Alzheimer's, but it gives you somewhat, it seems to be that if that high cholesterol helped to protect individuals when there wasn't enough sun. Let's continue this in a moment. Dr. Sharon Moylem is our guest. We'll be right back. Don't